Good afternoon, my name is Diego. I'm a C and C++ developer and also a Python lover. So I'm going to talk about Python and C++ together, the beauty and the beast. Just for those C++ fans, C++ is not the beauty, okay? <laughs> Just in case. So uh, why we want to do this? First, we have Python programs and we want them to run fast. So we will extend them with C and C++, or we want to wrap existing functionality we don't want to re-implement in Python. So we will create a wrapper around an existing C++ library. But those are for reasons for Python developers. For us, C++ developers, I, I told you one thing. I was in a local meetup. It was a FinTech C++ meetup. Okay? There were five talks. Three out of them, three out of five, uh, they were about um, integration C++ and Python, because the customers of the, of the developers, they were requesting that. So you have an amazing FinTech library, C++ library for doing something I want to integrate with my Django server. Okay, so you are going to create a binding for me for Python. Okay, so this is something that is, it is being done. There is a, another use case, interesting too, but less common, is to embed a Python scripting inside our C++ application, but it's less common. So, to build Python and C++ extensions, there are like three approaches. The first one is writing Python. So we would have a, like a dynamic library already built with our traditional methods, and we could use C types or C uh, foreign function interface, especially if we are running PyPy, Python distribution, to wrap the dynamic library to translate that to Python syntax, okay? But in this case, we will be writing Python code. Then we can write our extension in C and C++. There are three ways here. The Python C API from the C Python uh, canonical distribution. And there are two C++ projects. They are called PyBind11 and uh, the famous Boost Python one. There is also a different set of, uh, a different approach. It will be like, for example, using an IDL that will generate C++ or C, or C code. Uh, there is a famous project, it's, it's really interesting, it's called Sweet. It can generate uh, binding for many languages, not only uh, Python and C++, but, but for other languages too. But this is out, out of the scope of this talk. I'm going to talk about programming C++. So we are going to see C++ code. So our goal here is to uh, be able to run this Python code. Okay? But the implementation of this add function will be implemented in C++. In this case, we will start first with the Python C API. It is very simple, but it is C. The first thing we need in our implementation is the, the function itself. It will be always the same. It's a function, it will get some uh, Python objects. I have to extract, I have to parse those objects and uh, get my uh, native variables. In this case, I'm going to extract some floats from the Python objects. Then I will do my computation in C++. In this case, I'm just adding the numbers. And I have to do the, the step back. From my native variables, I have to construct a Python object to return to the Python interpreter. So a bit verbose, but simple, simple enough. Then I have a, another important part is the, the table. It's a table in which I declare with, which functions are being exported to the Python model. This, uh, if I, this name here, add, will be the, the name that will be used from Python to call this function. Okay? And finally, I have to declare this initialization of the model. This is a function that will be called when I import this model in, from Python. It will be just called once. But we have a problem here. What I've just shown you is the Python C API for Python 2.7. You might know that there are Python there are uh, two branches, that are Python 2.7 and Python 3.5. Uh, the main stream is still Python 2.7, but Python 3.3x is, is, is getting traction too. So we have a problem here. And the problem is that the, the API has also changed. So if I want to create my extension and, and be it compatible with 2.7 and 3.5, I'm going to have a problem because I have to manage those variability inside my C++ code. Also, if I, if I want to expose an object, uh, objects and classes to my Python, Python code, the interface from the Python C API is terrible. It's, it looks like, like this code here, 
just for the declaration of the struct. But if I want to do things like the emulating the constructor or uh, other functions, I will have code that, like this. So, so I certainly don't want to go into this. I've done it, if there is no other way, but uh, there are better solutions. In this case, there are two of them that are really, 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 really useful. I have on the left, PyBand 11, and on the right, I have Boost Python, okay? In this case, I just code in C++ or in C, and I declare, in some point, the things that I'm exporting from my C++ code to the Python with, um, with a def. Okay? The syntax is very similar for both of them. Actually, PyBind 11 is like the successor of the, of the Boost Python. Okay? It's like a, a continuation of the, of the project. So it's very similar in, 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 in many things. And the internals of the Boost Python, for example, they will manage these things for us. So it will have the check of the Python version. If we are in Python uh, bigger than three, it will do some things. If I'm in Python 2.7, it will do other things. So it is already wrapping this, this variability for us. Uh, the basic uh, object orientation with Boost Python and, and PyBind 11 is very simple. In this case, I'm showing just for, for PyBind 11, but the syntax is exactly the same for Boost Python and PyBind Py 11, okay? So I can declare my structs or my classes very simply with, in this case, I'm using just a public member called quantity, and I have to expose them with the class helper. Uh, in the class helper, I will use the, the definition of the init. It's the same as the constructor, but, but, but for Python objects, even if it is empty. I don't have a constructor here, but for Python, I have to de declare uh, the py init helper to, to create that constructor for, for me. And then I can use the dev read write to bind the, the member quantity to the py co corresponding Python object. With this binding, I can already create objects in my Python code. I can assign a value to the quantity uh, member. I can print it. I can use my objects in Python. Very convenient. Uh, let's do a little bit some more complicated things. What happens if I, I have a constructor here with a default value? And I also have a, a member function with a default value too. And here I have two overloads with a different parameter. Oh, of course, the, the goal is to run Python code like this, to create a food object and to give the food object to the, to the Looney uh, object too, so it will, it will change its state. So for Boost Python, the first thing for the default value in the constructor, there is an optional there, it works pretty well. So just to remember to use the optional for the, for the default value. But for the member function, it works di differently. So the mechanism for, with Boost Python is to declare some overloads. Some overloads, this will be like different calls to the same function uh, with uh, using the default value or not using the default value, using the, the user provide value, okay? And it is declared with the macro we, we see in the, in the first line. The overload for the GIF member function uh, has to be specified, but as long as we, as we specify the signature of the, of the function, it will work. And finally, we have to specify in Boost Python, we have to specify the return policy. We, we, we are telling the system to actually create a copy of what it's doing, so, uh, of the string that it's returning. The syntax with PyBind 11 is more convenient. For me, it's more homogeneous. In the constructor, I can use the default name parameter with a value. And the syntax is going to be exactly the same for the member function with the default value. Okay, so it is always the same. It is a bit inconvenient because as you can check, I'm repeating the, the value. So the Sylvester and Tweety strings they are both in the C++ code and in the binding because there is no way with template better moment to extract those default uh, values. So the approach in this case is duplicating things, but for me, it's just a small inconvenience 
and I prefer that with a with a say like a, it's easier to code it and it is like an homogeneous interface. Finally, the way to define overloads for the give function is exactly the same as the as the boost one. Just uh, specifying the signature for the for the function, and we are done. With respect to the STL, what happens if I now I want to use in the uh, in a in a struct in a class, I want to use a vector of a string in this case, or I want to, for example, to compute the average happiness of the of the loonies. So I will be provided with a vector of loonies with that syntax. I will run whatever inside. In this case, I'm just accumulating the the happiness of the loonies and then dividing by the size. Very simple. Or if I want to collect all the friends of all the loonies, I will be provided with a vector of loonies. And then I will return back a set of string with all the all the friends of the loonies. It's basically accumulating in a set uh, all the friends that uh, the instances have. So this typical STO code in Python 11, it is very simple. You just do exactly the same as for nor normal functions because they are mapped equal to primitive values, doubles, strings, and whatever. STL is completely mapped. So you, you have a standard mappings from STL vector to Python list. You have mappings from uh, sets to Python sets, and so on. And you can nest them up to any level. You can provide a vector of loonies, of a string, of, of whatever, until any level of nesting, and it will handle for you. So the only problem is, uh, is the, the behavior is defaulted. So a vector will be, will be always mapped to a list. Okay? But for me, it's perfect. So we can see the mapping of the functions with STL parameters and return, and the mapping of a member uh, of a class with uh, an STL vector. With boost, it's a bit more complicated because the mapping is not by default. So we have to use the, uh, we have to create the converters ourselves. In this case, uh, especially because boost doesn't have a Python set representation, I want to. I have to fall back to to the Python C API to do the things. So the first thing I will create a converter. In this convert, I will get the input of it will be a set of a string, and I will return a Python object. This Python object will be whatever I want. In this case, I want to return a Python set. Okay, so I get the set of a string, and I create my set, my Python set and return it. Okay. Once I have my converter, I have to register it. There is a way to register the converter. This operation I'm do, doing here is just the two Python converter. So I have a C++ value, and I want to return it to, to Python and convert it to Python, okay, to Python objects. But I also have to deal with the opposite, with the from Python. So I have a Python object, and I have to translate it to some STL struct, some uh, STL container. In this case, uh, it can be done. It is in the repo, so you can check. What I've done is instead of repeating against the, the construct that is going to be very similar, I, I've do some uh, template meta programming. Just actually, Stack Overflow did it for me, and so you can reuse the converter for different types if you want. Okay, but the but, but the structure is very similar to the to Python converter I just showed you. So this is uh, an overview of the of the basic syntax, okay, of both. But I want to to say you two things. The first thing is that the memory models for Python and C++ are, are widely different. Okay, so the typical approach of, of other languages is this one. Hey, the garbage collector will will manage it, and I don't care. So, and Python is not an exception. It is using garbage collection. It is using reference counting. So all the objects are reference counted. When they go to zero, they enter the garbage collector. There are three generators, three generations of uh, collection, um, and it do also like cycle detection. Okay, so it's a, it works fine, but it is a garbage collection. Okay, so this is something that we have to have in mind. Why? Because for example, I will show you if I want to create a callback. A callback is a Python function. I want to pass to my extension, and I want my C++ code call this Python function. function. Okay, so how can I achieve this? The first thing, I'm going to use an evil uh, global variable just to simplify things. 
okay, is going to be a Python object globally in my file. Okay? And then I will uh, implement by my set log function. It will receive my callback, my Python callback. I will extract it, and then I will store in my global variable. But first, I have to be careful. Why? Because I'm getting a Python object, and I'm going to store it. So I have to increment the count because I'm creating a copy and I'm, I'm storing the copy. I'm not, I'm not releasing it, I'm storing the copy. So first I have to increment the count of the, of the Python function that has been passed to me. The second line is decrementing the value I had for my log function. Why? Because what happens if it was set before? It, was, it had already been incremented by one. So if I didn't decrement by one, this value, it will leak memory, okay? So there will be a Python object living there forever. And the last, the last thing, now I can do the assignment between those safely. Then um, calling the, that uh, function, executing the callback is, is easy, just the same as the first function we, we saw, is to transform my C native variables to Python objects and execute the, the actual callback. This is actually calling the, the Python function. And finally, I have two Python objects here, value and result. I don't want there anymore. I can decrement the count so they are garbage collected. But I have to, rem to remember that because otherwise I will link memory. In the case of Boost Python, Boost Python doesn't have any provision for callbacks. So I, I have to manage it myself. So I will get a Python object. It's going to wrap a, a Python function. And I have to, to handle the, the decrement and increment of the reference count myself. Fortunately, PyBind 11 has automatic mapping from Python uh, functions to STD functions. So in this case, in, in PyBind 11, everything is automatic. Um, and I don't have to care at all about reference counting and everything, okay? Very convenient. So here I will have my global variable. It will get the value from the parameter when I register the callback. And it will call the function just like a normal C function, okay? I want to show you the internals of this because there's an interesting thing here. This is First, when I, I receive a Python function, the first thing is doing PyBind 11 is, is uh, wrapping it in a handle. A handle is just a, a, a handle for the, for the Python object, but it's not doing reference count. First, it checks that it's a callable, because if it is not a callable, it is not a function, and I won't be able to call it, so it checks that, and then it creates an object. An object is doing reference counting for us, automatically. Then the last step is to, to create a lambda. A lambda will be the thing that will actually be called when, when I'm running the function, okay? You can see the, the parameters, you can see the return, and there is a very interesting line here. It starts with gil scope acquire. Because I'm going to <laughs> tell you something. This is the Python concurrency model, okay? <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Uh, actually, Python, the C, C Python implementation, okay, it is not thread safe. So it has a global mutex that locks the interpreter always. So you cannot try, run the Python interpreter <laughs> concurrently. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you cannot have threads because Python has threads. But those threads will always be mutually exclusive if the, you are running the interpreter, okay? The, the good things, of course, is that the Python, uh, the C Python code is fast. It can be fast because it doesn't have to check for uh, re, re races and things like that. And it is simple because it is not so safe. So they prefer, they prefer to, to do that uh, trade-off instead of do, uh, building something uh, concurrent, really concurrent. So here's the important thing. We have the global interpreter lock. It's called the GIL. In this case, it is acquiring the lock. Why? Because this is a callback. I am in, in C++ code, right? But I am going to call 
a function that lives in, in Python. It's a Python function, okay? So to be sure that I'm not actually uh, messing with the interpreter, I'm acquiring the GUI to be sure that uh, everything, uh, I'm not entering concurrently in the Python interpreter. So before executing my Python function, I have to acquire the guild. But the opposite is also true. It's a very good thing here, because I, I'm building an extension. An extension, I'm doing it for, for performance, for example. Now I can run concurrent code, because if I have an expensive computation, let's guess that this, uh, fun, uh, this vector here has millions of loonies, okay? So this is going to be an expensive com computation. So I can do, uh, I can release the, the lock. Why? Because in this code below, I'm not using a Python object at all. Everything is C++ code. Everything is isolated in, in my extension. It is not using the Python interpreter at all. So I can release the, the, the lock, and if Python is running with multi-threading, it can pass the, the guild to another thread, and it will start to be concurrent. The Python interpreter is another thread, and my extension doing the accumulate in parallel. Okay, so something to, to really to take into account. So to summarize, um, we have those, those two main uh, technologies, Boost Python and PyBind 11. Boost Python is more manual. You have to care with the converters, with the STL, and also uh, the overloads. More manual works. And PyBind 11 is more automatic. It does a lot, of, a lot of things for you. I like it, but probably if you need something very specific, if you need a mapping, probably it's better to go with Boost Python. Uh, regarding the repositories, PyBand 11 is uh, very popular. It has a lot of start, it's really active, um, uh, so it's uh, something really interesting. I actually submitted an issue to the PyBand 11 and it was solved like in three hours. So yeah, so it's something to take into account. Yeah, uh, the documentation for PyBand 11 is a bit more tutorial-like, I like it. Uh, to be fair about the GitHub stuff for Boost Python, uh, now it is, Boost is split in several repositories, so it is less likely that people will start just the Boost Python repository itself. So just that 51 stars is, is not really fair compared with the Boost Python popularity. Okay. Uh, Python 11 is header only. It's really easy to integrate in your project. Okay. Boost Python, you have to build Boost Python. Of course, you, can, you could run BCP and extract only what you need, but finally, you, you need uh, Boost Python. Uh, the lower figures, uh, images, are the, the activity of the project. So you can get a, an idea of what projects are really active right, right now. For me, my decision, if I already depended on Boost Python, oh sorry, on Boost, in my project, I probably go with Boost Python, otherwise I surely go with PyBand 11. Finally, uh, there's a, a news case I wanted to, to tell you, is embedding Python. So if we are building a C++ application and we need a, an extension, like a, a language extension, instead of building my, my own language, my, my own, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, my, my own scripting language, I have like several uh, same settings. I could use, for example, ChildScript, so it's a good tool. Uh, I, could use for, I could, for example, embed uh, with uh, V8, I could embed JavaScript, like the Poco is doing, um, or I could use Python. It's very simple. I have here my, my C++ application. I just include Python, and I can run Python code. In this way, it's very easy to, to provide extension points for example, uh, conditional configuration. If I want my users to be able to, run, to, to write small scripts that configure my C++ application, you can do this way. Okay? So it's something to, to take into account. Don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Just use a language that existing and, have a, and you already have an interpreter for it. I wanted to, to tell you that um, everything I've shown is actually working. It's a, in a GitHub repo, okay? And I've set up things so it is uh, easy to, to run. Uh, I, I haven't uploaded the latest changes, so wait until tonight so I can push all the changes, please. But otherwise, it's just um, a repo. It works, it is only works with Windows, Visual Studio, and Python 2.7. I haven't tried for other platforms, sorry. Uh, but otherwise, if you are in Windows and with uh, Visual Studio, it, it should be very easy because it's just a clone the, the repo. I'm using the Conan package manager to get Boost and PyBind 11. 
and there is just a single strip, uh, script that will install the dependencies, build the extensions, and run some Python code that, that is actually uh, testing the extensions itself. So I think uh, time is over. Yeah, there's a question over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the question is, if there is a a way to um, to get the the Python path, so you don't have to add hard code in the application. Yeah, that, is that the question? Yeah. So uh, it's like uh, every setup, you can try to look for it. Of course, uh, you can see here instead of of hard coding this with Python set Python home. And some string, you can use. Sorry, <coughs> you can use environment variables, for example. So this is a set that will be run in the in the uh, in your environment, and it will set the the Python the Python path. Your application can can look for it. It will be in typical places. You can try to to a typical mechanism will be try to run Python, or a where Python or a which Python or whatever, and and find it. But if you don't Coding your application or you use an environment model, an environment variable, you will have to look for it. No, uh, uh, actually, there is a, a solution I've used, very convenient. You just go to uh, Python, copy the scripts and the lib uh, folder, put them into your project, besides your executable, and you're fine. And you will have an isolated Python interpreter in your application. So you don't have to depend on an external Python implementation. You can just wrap it in your project if you want. Um, I'm, uh, I'm so, uh, no, templates are not allowed in, in extensions. No, but, but any technology will, will, will uh, allow that. Yeah, actually, it's, it's the same as. Uh, Basically, it's an API. In API, using templates, it's complicated. I mean, a real API, not, not just a, a library API. So here is the same. You have a, a clear cut between Python and, and C++, and the template uh, stuff is not going to, to cross that, that, that frontier. Uh, two questions there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was the first slide. Yeah. Here, in it my math is a compulsory name, so my math is going to be the name of the module. And it has to match also the, the extension will be a dynamic library. It will be a dot .so in Linux. It will be dot .pyd in, in Windows. And that name has to be the same as the init name that appear, appears there. there. Yeah. Um, the same. Uh, here, the, 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 the extension name actually in this case, it's PyBind 11 math is the extension. It will be the file name. And this one will be boost math, will be the name of the extension. It will be the name of the, and the thing you have to import. You import boost uh, underscore math, and then call it boost underscore math dot add, whatever. Sorry, uh, over there first. No, uh, PyPy is actually uh, running with Python and just in time uh, uh, processing things. So this, this, all of this is based on the C uh, Python API. It's only for C Python uh, canonical uh, distribution. Yeah.
in order to be able to invoke an existing Python library, these teams, the, these changes are fairly intrusive. So I was wondering, like, you know, at, at what point an application owner would decide to make existing changes like this compared to a sort of a, a more loosely coupled use of the Python library they have? Uh, it, it depends. First, you have a library. Sorry, uh, yeah, repeat the question, sorry. Uh, so the question is, uh, why would, uh, this is intrusive. We are actually uh, cu coupling our code to, to um, the Python C API or Python 11 or whatever. Um, why would we, we, we want to do this? Uh, the question is, we don't. We don't want to do it. So actually, the process would be, I will first build my library, isolated. C++, C++, I will I have my Python code, and in between, I can do two things. I can write Python code with C types or CFFI, or I can write the binding. But the binding will be just like a, a separate layer in my, in my architecture. I will not couple it to the rest of my, of my C++ code. And you will have a layer there, and you will have to, to write this. Typically, it's just a file. Is a, a, a this a math file, a math CPP file that will contain the definitions of what you are exporting to Python. But this is typically one file. So actually, the coupling between both systems is not that, that hard. Yeah, other question? Yeah, so the question is that Python 3, 3, 4, or all three? Since if you define, uh, use only the version independent API, what, whatever module or team uh, will help you go doesn't, uh, like, doesn't depend on a specific version of Python. Oh, yeah. Whether it's 3, 4. Yeah, five. so the question is that there is a, an API mode that you can use it and it will uh, isolate you from the Python implementation. Yeah, so the answer is that no, no, I haven't used that in practice. Actually, uh, most of the code I do in Python is Python 2.7. So I, I haven't, I have a project with both Python 2.7 and Python 3.5, but uh, the projects that I've built extensions for were only Python 2.7 projects. Yeah, so, so, so the question is that uh, Boost Python has features to embed Python code in a C++ application. Um, Python 11 doesn't have any features to embed. Okay. Uh, actually, the, the use case for embedding is like uh, 1 to 99%. So many people are there writing extensions. People actually embedding Python in C++ application is a small fraction. So um, actually, for Boost Python, it's very useful. But um, for me, I have embedded Python in a C++ application. Uh, I, I did it with the Python C API because it's not that difficult. It depends on the interface and how much do you want to interact between C++ and Python code. But if you don't want to do a lot of things, uh, Python C API is, is fine too. Do you like Boost Python for embedding? <laughs> oh, Boost Python is great for embedding. I was just wondering if... Yeah, oh, of course. It, it, it is much easier than the Python C API. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, and this is a, a major feature compared, compared with Python 11 that doesn't have anything for embedding. They are STL vectors. Yeah, so the question is that templates doesn't fit the, these frameworks to, to build extensions. Uh, but I'm using, actually I've, I've shown some, some examples of uh, STD vectors. But those examples are uh, concrete instantiations. So, so you don't have uh, actually a template. You have an instance there, a clear instance. And, and, and PyBand11 knows how to map that 
to, to Python, but a generic template without, and then doing it, um, I mean, probably it could be done, probably it could be done, but I, I guess it is so much work for the frameworks to do that it is not work. Because typically the, the APIs between systems, they are not such, such generic. Yeah. So, uh, I, sorry, but uh, I think, yeah, session is over. So they are telling me that session is over. So thanks very much. For,